Ryan Reynolds here for, I guess, my hundredth mint commercial. No, 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 don't, no, don't, no. I mean, honestly, when I started this, I thought I only have to do like four of these. I mean, it's unlimited premium wireless for $15 a month. How are there still people paying two or three times that much? I'm sorry, I shouldn't be victim blaming here. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash save whenever you're ready. $45 upfront payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three-month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes. See details. Hey guys, and welcome to the Moms and Murder Podcast, a true crime podcast featuring myself, Mandy, and my dear friend, Melissa. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Mandy. How are you? I'm doing awesome. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As you can hear, I am sick. I think this is the second week in a, is it in a row that we were saying that we were sick. Yeah. We both had stomach things. I was I had a cold thing earlier in the week and didn't see you, and somehow you ended up with it. So it's just the crud. Yeah, it's something is going around. I always usually get a summer cold. It just always catches me by surprise whenever I get a cold in August because it doesn't seem right. Having a cold is miserable, but having a cold in this heat is even like 10 times worse somehow. <laughs> so, so I am not feeling well. And I apologize that you have to listen to me sounding the way that I sound. I'm going to do my best to to not sound, sound better? sick. Yeah, I mean, I really can't help it. Yeah, there's not a lot you can do. You're just kind of, you're here. That's what, that's all we can ask this week. Yeah, yes. And I still have all the energy that I had last week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'll believe you on that one. Let's see. All right. So we're going to get right into it this week. This week's story was suggested to us by a listener and a member of our Facebook group who had a personal connection to this case. And so I decided that we would do it this week. So the story comes to us from Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. And Melissa, have you Googled Broken Arrow for us? I have. I really have. So according to the 2010 census, Broken Arrow has a population of around 98,000 residents, which makes it the fourth largest city in the state. Oklahoma itself has a lot more going on than Broken Arrow, to be honest. So you'll hear some Broken Arrow facts and you'll hear some Oklahoma facts. Broken Arrow was actually named the ninth most customer-friendly U.S. city in 2016. Do you understand why I went outside of Broken Arrow if I'm finding Yelp reviews on cities and their popularity? <laughs> Oklahoma also has more man-made lakes than any other state, having around 200 of them. Gordon Matthews, who was born in Oklahoma, was the inventor of an electronic system that we now know of as voicemail, and this allowed you to store your audio messages. Remember back in when you were younger, everybody was younger, and you had the actual recording with the tape and all of that? That's kind of what he made, and that was patented back in 1982. On January 22nd, 1997, a lady named Lottie Williams of Tulsa, Oklahoma, became the only person who has ever been hit with space trash. She was actually hit in the shoulder by a piece of rocket that was six inches long. She didn't have any real damage, but the odds of this happening are one in several trillion. So in honor of Lottie's great and terrible luck, I have made up a top five list of things that are less likely to happen than being hit by space trash. Oh boy. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's real good. So number five, your weatherman correctly predicts the weather for tomorrow. Things that are more likely to happen or less likely to happen than being hit by space trash. Number four, you bring your kid to any type of play place and leave without them picking up 15 different illnesses. <laughs> Number three, this is mostly for women trying on and loving the first bathing suit you pick up. True. Number two, your spouse knowing where the scissors are in the house. And that's a shout out to King of Queens. One of my favorite clips comes from Doug looking for scissors in the house. But literally, my husband doesn't know where anything no. is. Yeah. Never, <laughs> never. And the number one thing that is less likely to happen than being hit by space trash is Maury Povich saying, you are the father and everyone on stage agreeing with the results. <laughs> <laughs> that is all I have this week. Go ahead, Mandy. 2006 was an exciting year for Jarrett Clark. 
His hard work and dedication was finally paying off, and he had just graduated from high school with his sights set on enlisting in the Army, which would be a complete change of pace for this teen who had lived in the same town for his entire life. His parents were absolutely beaming with pride over their son's success and what an outstanding young man that they had raised. Throughout his childhood and teen years, Jarrett was involved in numerous sports, including flag football, baseball, basketball, and soccer. In high school, he played on the football team and participated in weightlifting. He took his sports very seriously and enjoyed watching college and professional sports as well. His favorite teams were the Denver Broncos, the Florida Gators, go Gators, the LA Lakers, and the North Carolina Tar Heels. As a teenager, Jarrett took pride in his health and fitness and would often spend quality time with his mom by working out together. In fact, Jarrett was incredibly close with his mom and with his stepfather, and he loved to spend time with them and make them laugh, and they would do things as a family like go skiing, go on ski trips, or do water sports. Jarrett's mom, Tammy, was looking forward to celebrating Mother's Day with her son, which happened to fall on the same weekend following graduation. Being newly 18 and recently graduated, Jarrett was enjoying some newfound freedoms and had made plans to go with a group of his peers to celebrate their completion of high school and to kind of kick off the summer with a camping trip over the weekend of May 13th, 2006. Even though Mother's Day was on the same weekend, as I just said, his mom still encouraged him to go off and to have a good time with his friends, although Jarrett promised that he would be home by 10 a.m. the following day so that he could go and have a Mother's Day brunch with his family. They actually had plans to go to his grandmother's house and kind of do like a little family get together. Before heading off to the lake that Saturday afternoon, Jarrett surprised his mom with an early Mother's Day gift, and it was a picture frame that she was supposed to be able to put his graduation photo in as well as a vase that was full of flowers. And he gave her these presents a day early because he wouldn't be there first thing in the morning on Mother's Day. And he wanted to make sure his mom had those to wake up to. That's so thoughtful. It really is. Yeah, I know. That was super touching. I read that. I was like, oh, I just hope my boys treat me that way. I think of gifts the day after things happen. Like I seriously, I'm like, I have the best idea the day after your birthday. But before that, I'm just panicking and find something that ships two days on Amazon. I thought that was just so sweet that he even thought ahead to think I won't see her first thing in the morning and I want her to have this. Yeah, it was very sweet. So he then hugged his mom tight and told her he loved her before he headed out to Fort Gibson Lake with his friends. Sadly, this would be the last time that Tammy would see her son. The next morning, Tammy and her husband, Eric, began their day as usual, enjoying the morning while getting ready for this fun family day. But when 10 o'clock in the morning rolled around and Jarrett still had not come home from his overnight camping trip, nor did he call home, of course, everybody is really starting to get a little bit worried. It was really unusual for Jarrett to come home later than he said he would be home, especially on Mother's Day when, you know, he already had plans to hang out with his family. Jared's family began to make phone calls and trying to get in touch with his friends, and when they were unsuccessful, they started calling around to local hospitals and even jails, just looking for any information they could find if anybody had seen or heard from him. A little later that day, the phone finally did ring, but it wasn't Jared on the other end. It was actually one of his friends saying that he had Jared's phone and he was looking for Jared, but that Jared had left the campsite and taken off the night before and nobody knew where he was. Of course, Tammy is like distraught at this, this news that, you know, her son is missing, you know, I guess. Yeah, that's that's the moment when you're like, okay, something really is not right here. Like his friends have his phone. They're telling me he walked off from this campsite and nobody has a clue where he is. That's really, really scary. I, I mean, I would be absolutely a mess in getting news like that. So Tammy immediately contacted the police to report Jarrett missing. But unfortunately, and this was really frustrating for for Tammy and for the family, the police really initially brushed off any concern over Jared's alleged disappearance. And they kind of said, you know, young kids go out here all the time and they go camping, they drink and they lose track of time. And they were telling Tammy, you know, he's going to turn up, just give it a little time. Let's wait it out a little bit and, you know, try not to worry. So instead of enjoying this Mother's Day brunch and being able to spend quality time with Jarrett, 
Tammy really spent that entire Mother's Day just looking for him. Later that evening, Tammy finally got a hold of one of the boys that Jarrett had gone camping with, named Brandon Hargrove. When she spoke to Brandon, he was really flippant and casually told Tammy that her son was an idiot and that he had kicked his butt and he left him there. Brandon also alleged that Jarrett had attempted to rape a young woman named Courtney Manzer, who was dating Brandon, and had come along camping that night. So these are huge allegations he's making and also saying, I've gotten a fight with your son. Oh, also, by the way, he tried to rape somebody. That's a lot to take in yeah, at one time when your absolutely. kid's also missing. You have no idea where he is. So Tammy, of course, is distraught and baffled over this phone call. She refused to believe that her son would have tried to sexually assault anyone. Hearing that Jarrett had allegedly been beaten up and left in the woods led Tammy to truly believe that her son was in danger and possibly seriously injured. Without having the support of local police, she and her husband, which was Jarrett's stepdad, and some of their friends decided to drive out to the lake where the teens had been camping and search for Jarrett themselves. The group of searchers split up to cover more ground, and they were shouting Jarrett's name and really looking for any sign of him at all. And of course, this is all in the woods, but like thick brush on a lake. So the area is really rough. There's briars, which are just the devil in itself. So you're just walking through the thickest, grossest brush and you've got to look everywhere. You can't just say, we'll stick to the trails. And you know, that's where he is because you just do not know. After hours of searching and finding no clues as to Jarrett's whereabouts, his parents returned home, hoping and praying that Jarrett would just call or show up. Tammy truly believed her son was in trouble, but she still had hope and believed that they would find him alive. Three gut-wrenching days passed, and there was still no sign of Jarrett. And finally, the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigators agreed to get involved in the search for the missing teen. A team of law enforcement returned to the campsite where Jarrett had been last seen and ramped up the search efforts. That's when Jarrett's stepfather stumbled upon something really unsettling. It was one of Jarrett's shoes, which was found sitting on top of the grass in an area that would be on the way out of the campground. Jarrett's jacket was also found nearby. This discovery hit Tammy like a sack of bricks. Seeing Jarrett's clothing items made the reality of the situation come crashing down on her. So now your son has no phone, he doesn't have his jacket, and he's missing a shoe. None of this adds up to being like, okay, like that everything is fine and he just got lost. Police expanded their search area and continued to look for more clues, but they were really perplexed by the location of this lone shoe. It seemed to have been planted there on purpose, possibly to throw detectives off the trail. The search for Jarrett continued into the afternoon until officers finally found what they were looking for. Five days after Jarrett was last seen at the campground, everyone's worst fears were confirmed. Jarrett's body was found in the water. There were conflicting accounts of where exactly he was found. One source said that he was found 26 feet below the surface, while another said he was found floating around 300 yards away from the shore. Jarrett had visible bruises to his head and face and had clearly been badly beaten. Jarrett's mom and stepdad were still there helping in the search when his body was recovered, and Tammy was obviously devastated upon learning that her only child, who had such a bright future ahead of him, was gone. And we're going to get back into this story after a quick word from this week's sponsors. We've got a few months before we actually feel the fall weather here in Florida, but we know how to ring in the new season. And that's by ordering the 2019 FabFitFun Fall Box, which is on sale now. FabFitFun is a seasonal subscription box with full-size beauty, fitness, fashion, and lifestyle products. Now that Mandy and I have received a few boxes, I have to admit to feeling very spoiled. I'm not someone who drops a lot of money on beauty or lifestyle products for myself, so I love that I'm getting to try out new full-size products for such a great price. Each FabFitFun box retails for $49.99, but is guaranteed to have over a $200 value with full-size products. In my last box, I received Dr. Brandt's Needles No More Eye Depuffing Gel, and as someone with raccoon eyes, I have found it super helpful because it actually works. I would have never spent the money on it just to give it a try before, but now I can't live without it, and I'm so glad that it was in my box. FabFitFun is synonymous with quality, and one thing I really love in the fall box is the Aveda Damage Remedy Daily Hair Repair, which with a $30 value almost pays for the entire cost of the box. These boxes sell out fast, so sign up for yours today. To order your fall FabFitFun box, use coupon code MOMS for $10 off your first box at FabFitFun.com. Again, for $10 off your first box, go to fabfitfun.com and use coupon code MOMS. And now back to the episode. 
So police have just discovered the body of 18-year-old Jarrett Clark, and they've realized that something really terrible has happened to him. He was visibly beaten and had been found floating in the water in the lake near where he was camping. So there was obviously a lot of questions. How did this, what was supposed to be a celebration, you know, of this graduation turn into a complete nightmare? And who were these friends that Jarrett had gone out to the lake with and why would they want to hurt him? By all accounts, Jarrett was a very easygoing and fun-loving guy that would do anything for the people that he cared about and considered friends. He was really the guy in the bunch who would stick up for someone if they were being bullied, and he didn't get involved in petty arguments or scuffles with his peers. It was clear how well-liked Jarrett was and how much his death affected the community. About 25 to 30 of his friends attended the funeral home visitation and said their final goodbyes. Over 400 students from the school attended his funeral. After an autopsy was performed, it was determined that Jarrett's cause of death was drowning. Toxicology reports showed that he had a blood alcohol level of 0.04, which of course is nowhere near high enough to be intoxicated. And they were actually saying that the alcohol in his blood may have partially been due to the natural decomposition process and microbes that are released. So the first thing the police had to do was determine who was even with Jarrett that night, as well as attempt to figure out if there were any other campers nearby that could have witnessed or heard anything. What a massive undertaking that would be to even at a campsite to try to track down like who was there in in the immediate area and try to talk to them and hope that you don't miss somebody that, you know, might actually have information. Well, and it depends really what kind of campgrounds this is, because I'm sure there are like you know, like our state parks and stuff, you make reservations. And so they have names and stuff they can pull. But then there's those like primitive camping people that just like camp in places. How do you keep track of primitive people? The whole thing is they're primitive. They don't want (laughs) to, they want to be off the grid and do this. So yeah, that's a huge, huge, huge thing. And then hoping that people have seen something. Police learned that Jared had been invited out on this camping trip by a classmate named Brandon Hargrove and his girlfriend, Courtney Manzer. There were also two other teens there that night, and one of them was Brandon's sister, Dana, and the other was Dana's boyfriend, Tony Wallen. Although Jarrett did have a wide circle of close friends, this group was actually not that close with him. Brandon had just met Jarrett in their senior year of high school through their weightlifting class, and even though they were acquainted, they weren't really super close as friends. Brandon really wasn't even the type of friend or person in general that Jarrett would typically surround himself with. He had a bad reputation for being hot-headed and having a very short temper, as well as being addicted to pills. And he had recently pled guilty on a marijuana and paraphernalia charge just a few months before Jarrett's death. In fact, Brandon hadn't even graduated along with Jarrett because he had actually dropped out of high school months before. But there were other unsavory things about Brandon, and he was known for being incredibly jealous and possessive over his girlfriend, Courtney, and would fly off at the handle if he perceived that she was getting attention from any other guy. With all of these things considered, many of those close to Jarrett wondered really why he would have even accepted this invitation to go out to the campground with these particular people in the first place. But it wasn't too long before rumors surfaced that may have explained his decision to go. Word around town was that Jarrett and Courtney had crushes on each other, and then it may have actually been Courtney who persuaded Jarrett to come along on this camping trip. Police worked to track down Brandon for questioning. The story they got from him was that Jarrett had simply walked off from the campsite following a verbal argument. After a little more pressing, Brandon admitted that the fight was actually more heated than that, and he told detectives that they had actually had a physical fight, and both of them got their punches in before Jarrett left. The big question, of course, is why did this fight break out in the first place? Luckily, a woman came forward with some helpful information for police. Sylvia Gibbons had been out at Fort Gibson Lake camping with her teenage son, Patrick, as well as her boyfriend and her boyfriend's brother. Their campsite was situated in close proximity to where Jared and his friends were staying that night. Sylvia alleged that she was just about to cook food that evening when she heard arguing coming from the direction of Jarrett's camp, which she said made her boyfriend feel very uncomfortable, and then they all decided to leave, which is like a big deal if you're camping. You've got all your crap everywhere. To leave, you have to be pretty uncomfortable. 
Right. Otherwise you were you were staying <laughs> you were staying for the long haul. So the two brothers were sort of these bad boy brothers and they both had long criminal backgrounds. Sylvia's boyfriend was actually out on parole at the time of Jarrett's murder and Sylvia claimed that he didn't want to be anywhere near a fight going down because of the possibility of police showing up and he didn't want to be caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. Makes perfect sense to me. Absolutely, yeah. So the information piqued the interest of police who speculated that these two criminals could have actually had something to do with the murder and that Sylvia was possibly trying to help them cover their tracks by stating that they all left the campsite. That also makes sense. Right. Detectives immediately worked to track down Sylvia's boyfriend to question him about the events of that night. But when they found him, he had a different version of events than what Sylvia had told police. He was very forthcoming with the officers about the real reason why the four of them had left the lake that night. He said that a fight broke out at a neighboring campsite and it made him really nervous, but what really worried him was the fact that Sylvia's son, Patrick, had decided to go over and get involved. At that point, he wanted to hightail it out of there before police were called and he found himself in the middle of a questionable situation involving a bunch of teenagers. Of course, police want to get to the bottom of all this and needed to go back to Sylvia and ask her why her son had gotten involved in this fight between Jarrett and Brandon. So she eventually owned up to it and told the police that while she knew it looked really bad for her and, you know, especially now that she's lied to the police and been caught doing so, she said the reason that she didn't tell the full truth was really just to protect everyone that she was with. But she was adamant that her son's role in the fight was that he went over there to attempt to break up the fight and not actually be a part of it. And so when the news broke that a teen had been killed that night, Of course, she's scared and terrified and and didn't want to mention, you know, my son was involved in this in any way because that puts police attention, you know, on you even. And especially it's scary if you really didn't have anything to do with something like that. I can kind of see her logic. Me too. I'm not wanting to divulge that kind of information because that's a big deal. Like, you, you know, you're going to be in kind of hot water a little bit while they look into it. Right. I know I understood that too. And you know, I like to get everything out on the table, but I can understand how a mom would say, well, he wasn't actually involved. He only did this, but there's no real reason to bring him into this. Right. So Sylvia told the police officers that it was dark that night and she wasn't able to get a good look at the people that were fighting, but she did get the impression that this whole quarrel had began over a girl that was there and the girl that would be there that would start this fight, of course, would be Courtney. So we mentioned earlier that Brandon had this reputation for being a jealous boyfriend. So this was really a credible lead that investigators wanted to look further into. So next up for an interrogation was Courtney Manzer, who originally backed up this story that Jarrett took off on his own accord following what was a pretty mild argument. But this time, she told the police that the fight was more serious than they had been led to believe. According to her, the fight started when Brandon got the impression that Jarrett was flirting with her, but the altercation quickly turned even more dangerous when Tony Wallen, the other male teen, got involved. So Tony, who was there with Brandon's sister Dana, had allegedly gotten himself riled up over this idea that earlier in the night, Jarrett had stolen his marijuana. And so the tensions had really been rising between all three of these young men all night long. So these two guys teamed up and it turned into a two-on-one brawl in which they took turns striking Jarrett in the head repeatedly. At one point, Brandon physically restrained Jarrett while Tony viciously hit and kicked him as hard as he could. Courtney told the police that this was all she knew and that Jarrett had fled the campsite badly beaten, but that he was alive when she saw him last. Although the detectives were slowly learning more about what happened that night, they still didn't really have a lot and they didn't have any way to prove that Jared's death, which was ruled as a drowning, was anything more than an accident. Even with all the information they did know, the trail sort of dried up and the case went cold. Can you imagine being this family? Because there are all these witnesses. There are these people that saw him. There are these people that are saying, hey, I beat your son up and all of this. And it's kind of like, well, that's all it is. Like, we can't do anything else. And you understand they have to be able to prove something. But, oh, my gosh, like, this just seems like a lot. You have people that were there. And for his parents and his family, like, what a nightmare. You just hope that, you know, 
And to, and it seems like that would be enough. And that was really frustrating about when I was researching about this case. It was so frustrating to see that they were brushed off time and time again, kind of. And it, it almost yeah. like wasn't being taken seriously considering all the information that they did have. And I just can't imagine just how frustrating that is. And like, what do you do? You know, you're kind of at the mercy of the police and their, you know, their investigation. And there's nothing you can hope and wish that it would be different all you want. But I just, it's so terrible and heartbreaking. And for his family to have to go through that. Yeah, for sure. So we actually have some more details of this story, and we're going to get into them after one last break for a word from this week's sponsors. Sometimes I like to dream about the day I walk into the kitchen and my kids have made a delicious or even edible meal for us all to share together. Then I wake up, remember I'm a few years off from that, and start making dinner for people that really appreciate it. That is, unless it's a HelloFresh night. HelloFresh is a meal kit delivery service that delivers easy seasonal recipes and pre-measured ingredients right to your door so all you have to do is cook and enjoy. HelloFresh makes cooking delicious meals at home a reality, even if you're me. From step-by-step recipes to pre-measured ingredients, you'll have everything you need to get a wow-worthy dinner on the table in just about 30 minutes. You can also add extra meals to your weekly order, as well as yummy sides like garlic bread and cookie dough. So not only are your meals delicious, but now you even have dessert and bread. Much like Queen Oprah, I love me some bread. This month, one of the meals I made was the pork carnitas tacos with pickled onion and Monterey Jack. You guys know I am the taco queen, so this was a fun and delicious way to mix up a favorite meal in my house. My kids love following the recipes along with me, so it's a fun way to include the whole family. I also love that you can easily change your delivery days, food preferences, or even skip a week whenever you need to. HelloFresh makes it all easy. For $80 off your first month of HelloFresh, go to HelloFresh.com slash MomsAndMurder80 and enter MomsAndMurder80. Again, for $80 off your first month of HelloFresh, go to HelloFresh.com slash MomsAndMurder80 and enter MomsAndMurder80. Life comes at you fast, but when you're looking for counseling, minutes can feel like hours and hours can feel like days. You want help quickly, but how will you fit it into your schedule? Our problems rarely arise during normal work hours, so why is counseling mainly available during normal business hours? BetterHelp Online Counseling is there for you. Is there something that interferes with your happiness or maybe something that's preventing you from achieving your goals? BetterHelp has you covered and at times that are convenient for you. BetterHelp offers licensed professional counselors who are specialized in issues such as depression, anxiety, relationships, trauma, grief, and more. You can connect with your professional counselor in a safe and private online environment. You can schedule secure video or phone sessions, plus chat and text with your therapist without ever having to leave the house. BetterHelp is secure, convenient, and professional. If you ever find you want to change counselors, you can do so at any time with no additional charge. Financial aid is also available to those who qualify. Best of all, it is truly an affordable option, and Moms and Murder listeners get 10% off your first month. Simply fill out a questionnaire to help them assess your needs and get matched with a counselor you'll love within 24 hours. Go to betterhelp.com slash moms and use discount code moms for 10% off your first month. Again, for 10% off your first month, go to betterhelp.com slash moms and use discount code moms. And now back to the episode. Two years have passed since Jarrett Clark was found dead in Fort Gibson Lake and his mother, Tammy, was still searching for answers and hoping that those responsible for Jarrett's death would be held accountable. In March of 2008, Tammy received an email from Courtney's cousin that reignited her desperation for further police investigation. In this email, the cousin told Tammy that Courtney had been living with her mom at the same time this took place. So this is the cousin's mom, which is Courtney's aunt. It's a little convoluted. You know, people are living with different people. So just follow along. She she is aware of things is basically what <laughs> what right. we're getting at here. Right. So allegedly, Courtney had come home from that camping trip. She was dirty and distraught. And after a bit of pressing from her aunt, she spilled the entire story about what had happened to Jarrett, including where his body was before it was actually even found. Basically, Courtney admitted that Jarrett was killed and placed in the lake. This cousin, whose name is intentionally kept anonymous, had gone to the police and told them that she had information that Jarrett had been left in the lake and that she knew that his jacket and one of his shoes had been intentionally planted in a location that would confuse the police. These are big details to to bring they out. Are. I'm assuming that these were not out in the press, that they found his shoe and his jacket. I'm wondering if that was that information was even out in the public because a lot of times in police investigations, they keep a little bit of information to themselves. So if something comes up, they can 
find credibility in it or whatever. And so, so knowing these two very big pieces of information, that's got to put, you would think that would set off alarms, you know, to the police, but really they kind of didn't care. They didn't follow up on it, I should say. They didn't right. really go further and give a lot of credence to what she was saying. And she even says in this email that, you know, she tells the police that she knows about this and three days later, Jarrett's body was finally recovered. So she knows a lot of information and she's saying like, she said all this right off, you know, right off the bat. The email went on to describe what Courtney allegedly told her about that night and the story goes as follows. Brandon was being his usual arrogant self that night and she said that she and Brandon had been smoking pot, taking pills and drinking alcohol, but that Jarrett wasn't participating in that stuff. Courtney had always really liked Jarrett, and at some point during the night, she ended up in a tent with Jarrett. Nothing sexually happened, and they were really just talking, but when Brandon found them together, he became enraged, and the fight began. She said that Brandon and Tony had beaten Jarrett to the point that they believed they had accidentally killed him, and then they panicked and drug his body to the water where they left him, face down. Brandon, Courtney, Tony, and Dana then packed up their camp quickly, took Jarrett's phone, his jacket, and his shoe, discussed what they would all say, and then parted ways and went home. At the time that Tammy received this email, Brandon was actually in jail on unrelated charges. He had been convicted in the spring of 2008 of second-degree burglary, knowingly concealing stolen property, possession of a controlled substance, and paraphernalia, and malicious injury mischief. So at this point, you know, Tammy gets this email and these, like you said, these are kind of important details that, that she now has learned. So she urged the police to reopen the investigation into Jared's murder. And she really wanted them to speak with the four people that were there that night. Again, they've already interviewed all these people, but they want, she wants the police to go re-interview them again. And she wants them to take a second look at the evidence, which I don't really think that's too much to ask in some of these cases that are no. unsolved because how many times do you hear where evidence is just reexamined and they're like, they find something that's really important. So that's really all she was asking for them to do at this point. However, in a bizarre twist of fate, Brandon was killed in a drunk driving accident on July 18th, 2008. There were three other passengers in the car and only one of them survived. Ironically, Brandon actually drowned in the accident after his truck lost control of going around a curve and went airborne before landing upside down in about 18 inches of water. And Brandon was unable to free himself from the vehicle. And the officials said that alcohol and a very high rate of speed were factors in this accident. At this point, the police believe that the case might be difficult to prosecute with Brandon dead since they viewed Jared's murder as a conspiracy between Courtney and Dana and Tony. But they reexamined the evidence that they had and they kept searching for a way to bring justice for Jared. One thing they focused their attention on was the fact that Jared's exposed sock from the foot that they took his shoe off of was tattered and it had briar stuck in it, which police believed was proof that Jarrett had been dragged. And if he was dragged, then that would prove that there was intent behind placing him in the lake and he didn't just wander into the water on his own. Things were moving really, really slowly, but about five months later, police got a new important piece of information from another witness that had been at the lake that night. She was asleep when she was suddenly awakened by bright headlights shining into her tent. And so she kind of gets up a little dazed and confused and, you know, opens up her tent and looks around outside. But all she sees is a white pickup truck and it's backed up to the water. And they were kind of like, she could hear like tires moving and revving. And she assumed that someone had gotten stuck in the mud and was trying to get out. So she went back to her tent and went back to sleep. It wasn't until the next day when she saw the news about Jarrett's disappearance that she speculated that these things could be connected. This was really important information that the police probably wish they would have had sooner because Brandon Hargrove just so happened to drive a white pickup truck. So oh, wow. it's, it's just really another piece of the puzzle, you know, whenever you're hearing these little details. And people sometimes don't think that these things are that important, right. but then it Everything is important in in an investigation like this. So with all this evidence pointing to Jared's friends, which I'm using very loosely, the police contacted Courtney again, and they were going to re-interview her. They really put the pressure on her by telling her 
you know, things are looking really bad for you right now. And they were urging her to confess the entire truth about what happened that night. They really suspected there was more to the story and they were so close to really figuring out exactly what had happened. So she relayed a similar story to the one that her cousin had wrote about in that email, but she actually included a few other pretty distressing details. So the part about Jarrett fleeing from the scene of the attack was actually true, but what Courtney did not mention the first time in her previous interviews was that the moment Jarrett escaped was not where the fight ended. She told the police that when he went to run for safety, Brandon and Tony chased him down into the woods and continued to brutally beat him in the head. Fearing they had killed him and knowing they can't just leave his body there for anyone to find, they devised a plan to use Brandon's truck to move Jared's body into the lake. Courtney told the police that they had discussed what their story would be and they believed that they would get away with it. At this point in the investigation, things were pretty muddled and the police still really didn't have a lot in the way of physical evidence. And the witness accounts of what happened were kind of confusing and conflicting and everything was really piecemeal. They're kind of trying, they don't have a lot of solid information to go on. In December of 2008, Tammy began the process of having a grand jury investigate the circumstances of Jared's death. So just a quick note, if you're not familiar with what a grand jury is, I know you've probably heard that term before, but if you don't know what it is, it's a group of 12 to 23 people, and they're selected to just look at the validity of an accusation before it goes to trial. So their purpose is really to decide whether or not like there's even enough probable cause to bring criminal charges, if that makes sense. Yeah. So it's it's like a trial before a trial. It's, it's just seeing if you even have a case really is what I right. would say as it. Unfortunately, the grand jury did not recommend indictments due to what they called a lack of evidence. And this is, of course, a very defeating blow to Jared's family and friends. There were actually conspiracies swirling around this case, especially as it pertained to the way that it was investigated. It's actually thought that Brandon and Dana Hargroves were relatives of a Wagoner County commissioner named Jim Hargrove. The accusations of being related were denied, but there were numerous credible sources that indicated that Jim was actually the great uncle of these two teens that were involved in this. Mm. So Tammy and her husband suspected that this could have had something to do with why Jarrett's case wasn't handled differently or taken seriously from the very beginning. Well, I would agree because to me, this case, especially being a camping thing, you're not inside of a house beating somebody up. You're out in the woods. There's a tent. It's a piece of little material in between you and other people. People are going to hear. And you've got four witnesses. I mean, four people, and they all have to say the same story. It seems like if you put any pressure on one of them, somebody could have cracked, you know, years ago. Yeah. But, you know, like if one person kills somebody, they can take it to their grave. But four people, you just need to do a little something. It's crazy to me that this went on so long without them getting any answers. For the next several years, Tammy struggled with the loss of her only child. Certain things would remind her of her son and the grief would come flooding back for her. She had always kept the flowers he had given her the day before he died, even after they dried up, and she held onto the memory of Jarrett telling her and his stepfather he loved them right before he walked out of the door for the very last time. Tammy has gotten involved in the community and worked to coordinate a National Day of Remembrance for murder victims. She's also planted trees to honor her son's memory, as well as dedicated a picnic bench with his name on it that's at Broken Arrow High School. Although two grand juries failed to indict Courtney, Dana, and Tony, the case remained open but inactive. In February of 2014, a tip line was opened in this case, and on February 28, 2014, Courtney Manzer was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. The DA stated that, quote, she acted along with others with malice and unlawfully placing him in the water and causing him to drown, end quote. Dana Hargrove was taken into custody about three months later and was charged with conspiracy to commit first degree murder, first degree murder, and being an accessory after the fact. The final arrest in this case was made in the summer of 2014 when Tony Wallen was taken into custody and charged with first degree murder. He pled no contest and was found guilty and sentenced to 20 years with eight years in the Oklahoma Department of Corrections and 12 years suspended. He was the first in the case to be sentenced. Courtney Manzer pled guilty to accessory after the fact and was given a light sentence. 
She was credited for time served and only had to spend two additional years in jail and then would have five years on parole. Eight years after Jarrett's tragic death, justice had finally been served. This story really got me this week. We uh, we said that last week, too, I think. I feel like we say it a lot. <laughs> we do. I mean, they're all they all have something about them, like we said. It's just so hard to think that, you know, yes, they had beaten him up so badly, but that he actually was not dead. And you don't know, like he, he doesn't have, he may have not had to die. It, you know, if, some, if the kids would have been like, this has gone way too far. Like we need to like tell somebody or get him help somehow instead of trying to, you know, cover it up and put him in the lake. It's just so heartbreaking to like learn that he was alive and that he drowned. Yeah. And just also unnecessary. If anyone would have just said, Hey, leave the campsite. We don't want you here. We don't like what you're doing. Allegedly what Jared was allegedly doing. How hard would that have been? It, he could have left. He could have been back home with his family. Just very upsetting. And upsetting that four people would be like, okay, we'll all cover for you. You know, the girls could have even said they did this horrible, horrible thing. But yeah, they decided to keep their mouth shut and put this family through even more pain. Okay, so we are going to do our last thing before we go. A little different. We keep saying that and then we do the same thing. So just just go along this journey with us. So I'm not going to explain this right, but basically Mandy's going to have to argue or stand up for a thing she doesn't believe in and I will do the same thing. So we're going to have state our opinions, but they're definitely not our opinions. When you hear these, you will say, oh my gosh. So Mandy, these are both from Paula D in our Facebook group, Queen Mayo, one of my favorite people. Hers are why households should be limited to one pet. Mandy's going to say, she's going to argue why households should only have one pet, which might kill her while even speaking. (laughs) And mine is going to be why streaming services should be banned and we should have to go back to the days where new episodes of shows only aired once a week. And I'm not kidding. My hands are sweaty even thinking about that. (laughs) Mandy, do you want to kick it off or you want me to? I would like you to. Okay, here we go. So I'm going to argue for why we should go back to one episode a week. Remember back in the 90s when we all just looked forward to television shows? Saturday mornings, we sat around and we watched cartoons as a family, as a family unit. And you didn't leave. You knew TGIF meant you were going to watch Step by Step with your family and eat pizza that night. It was a whole thing. Where do the pizza days go? We don't have them anymore because now we can just pull things up on Netflix. You can just watch things whenever. So I'm watching something. My daughter's watching something. No one's watching anything together because we have Netflix. Netflix is tearing families apart. And (laughs) I am here to say we need to bring back the days of having to watch television. Oh, God. One show can only be seen at a time. So if you miss Below Deck Mediterranean this week, you cannot see it again. And guess what? Then you will not know what happened with Hannah and Joelle. And you'll be really, really upset all week. But that's okay because we will learn togetherness as a family, as a community. I think we could really (laughs) take this on and change the world. Maybe we'll watch less TV. We'll do more reading. These are all things that are very important to me. And if I was to run for public office, this is the platform I would stand on. I can't take it anymore. This is garbage. Netflix (laughs) has to go. (laughs) Wow. I don't know how I am ever going to follow that up, Melissa. Think of the most delusional things you can and think of what people tell you about having multiple pets and just go with it and act as crazy as possible. I think you can do it. I think you can do it. Mandy, I think you should only have one pet. Now tell me why I'm right. (laughs) pets are really stinky and they will stink up your whole entire house and leave hair and dirt everywhere (laughs) these are actual terrible things about having multiple pets and that is why you should limit them to one i am actually going to get rid of all my pets after i get done recording this i feel like (laughs) oh melissa i can't argue to have one pet it does seem like blasphemy to you. I mean, I could do it for you. It really but does. It. I cannot. I think, okay. It is blasphemy. It is blasphemy. I'm going to give you a bonus one if you want it. What about Chipotle is overrated? I don't think you can do this. I think we have really <laughs> hit a hard spot for you. And I think you just, you're too pure and you just cannot argue against these things you truly love. I can't. I can't even think of what I would say about them. Well, Chipotle gets people sick a lot, and I still go there, but apparently some people are like, no more pork carnitas. I'm not going to eat there. So Yeah, you shouldn't. Mm-mm. 
If you don't want to, you shouldn't, but I'm going to. <laughs> I feel like the best time to go to Chipotle is right after they have the recall and they have to pull things down because everyone has to be so careful and they're on their toes and that's like the time you're not going to get sick. So you're saying to go there in the midst of an E. coli outbreak? Yes, yes, yes. You go like right whenever they say <laughs> Chipotle's fine and you go like some people are like, no, I'm going to give it a few more days, but you go and you just buy a lot of toilet paper and you hope for the best. <laughs> This kind of went off the rails. Let us know if you like it. Let us know if the if you do like it, if we can come up with a name for the segment. We'll give you credit. But I don't I couldn't come up with anything for it. And who knows if we'll ever do it again. You've got to hate things more, Mandy. And I do hate things. I mean, well, right now I just hate being You don't feel good. Yeah. Feeling the way I feel. I don't feel good. So I don't really have the tenacity. Yes. Energy. Or the or the quickness. I don't I can't think on my toes right now and come up with things. Okay. I will give you that. You did a great job and you're only going to have one animal from now on. I totally believe that. Okay. Yeah, I am. I'm going to just, <laughs> I'm going to thin the herd immediately and go down to one animal. Okay. All right. We will be back next week. We are going to be recording our Patreon episode pretty soon before the end of the month. That is our Patreon is at patreon.com slash moms and murder podcast. We are going to cover the queen of Versailles this month and I'm very excited about that. Mandy is as well. And you can find that there. We have information in our show notes about our live show that's coming up September, I'm going to say 22nd. 22nd. Yes, thank you. September 22nd. 22nd. It's a Sunday in Hoover, Alabama. But I'm not going to try to remember all those facts. Just look at our show notes. They're there. We put our sources, everything. You can find it all in one spot. Have a great week, everyone. And we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much for listening to the Moms and Murder podcast. Make sure to check back with us next week for a new episode. You can also find us at momsandmurder.com where you can connect with us via social media. Please make sure you subscribe and give us five stars because giving us four stars would be a crime. Thanks so much.